I'm going to talk about one-on-one -on -one encounters. And I'm going to start by looking at a non-translated encounter of particular importance, which you may have seen. Uh, as you can see my introduction, I wasn't addressing you, I was translating Angela Merkel. You are standing in front of me, uh, and you're a very likable person. Any idea who the likable person might be? Some of you probably did see this. A girl called Reen Sawil. This was on June 15th last year. Uh, she's uh, part of a Palestinian family in Rostock, in the north of Germany. They are asylum seekers in Germany. And this was a televised encounter of the Chancellor, Merkel, with school children, Reem is 14 years old, has spent, or had spent at that time, four years in Germany uh, going to school. And she was on the list to be sent back to a Palestinian camp in Lebanon, as it turns out. Okay? Uh, in the encounter, though, Merkel says, you are, oh dear, that's strange, isn't it? Um, unheimlich, what happened to that? Unheimlich, uh, not at all Freudians, I guess, as, as uncanny, but here it's just exceptionally, particularly, strangely, really very. Uh, sympathetic is wrong, it's a false friend. Agreeable, pleasant, nice, likable, I said lovely to you, that seemed to work. Okay, mensch, uh, known to the people who've read uh, uh, Levy or who've uh, read Bertolt Brecht, the good dement from Z1. All these words are very hard to translate into English. I don't know into Hungarian. But those words particularly, and this, this whole exchange is very deeply embedded, and that is evidenced by the difficulty of translation, which is one reason why it's a non-translated exchange. Now, in this encounter, um, uh, the Palestinian girl, Lüchlin's Mädchen in the German press, uh, the uh, refugee, go, uh, explains what she wants. She doesn't come in with any negative uh, reclamations. There's no question of human rights. She just says, here I am. I have dreams like anyone else. I wonder if this is going to work. Um, this is a big experiment. There is a film there that's not happening. Okay, uh, just in case your German is not as good as hers after four years. The German is incredibly sophisticated. Um, let me just go through it. Uh, she has goals, she wants to study, it's something I really like to do. Uh, positive, 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 and it's repeated as such. And then, this is what's hard to translate, this mitgenießen, okay? Others are enjoying life, and I cannot, mitgenießen is enjoy with. I can't enjoy with. Why can't she enjoy with? Uh, because she's uncertain as to whether or not she's going to stay here. I hope it's clear to you that I'm talking about Germany so as not to talk about Hungary. Okay? But you can mentally translate this, I hope, to recent debates across Europe. And this morning I note that three ships left to return. Immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, we don't really know what they are because there hasn't been public debate on it. They are being returned to Turkey. They were returned this morning. Not Reem. Thanks to this televised experience, her family got a two-year extension, which just prolongs the agony of not knowing whether you're here or there. Okay? However, Reem, in the middle of this huge debate, which is a non-public debate in Europe, where decisions are made and we don't know why they're made and we don't know who's making them, we have this particular encounter. Now, Merkel, in her response to Reem's presentation, gives a very ra reasoned and quantified 
replied. Well, you're very nice, she says. You're a very likable person. Unheimlich, sympathetic man. But there are thousands of you, and we cannot accept all the thousands of Palestinians. Okay. And, and I must admit, prior to that, there is a discussion where she does say, look, there's that, you've got those problems, but they're all the Syrians, and the Syrians' problems are greater. And she does give a, a, a balanced, quantified response. But she is unable to talk to that girl in particular, unless it's to say, which is what she does, um, well, you can't have every all of you, except you have to accept all of Africa, okay, today. Uh, 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 okay, the, the quantitative argument, the money is, uh, the, the numbers say, you can't all come. There are thousands and thousands. Do you see this problem? And then she says what every Freudian would delight in, oh, come. <laughs> you can't all come, but oh, come. <laughs> How does she get from you thousands can't come, but oh, you can? And if we're lucky, we might see this. Let's see. Uh, and this is the exchange that I really want to analyze in some detail. Okay. Okay, so basically on the surface, and as it was reported in the Spanish press, um, she says, why can't I stay? She starts to cry, and the Chancellor, who's just said politics is hard, uh, shows that she nevertheless is soft, and she becomes mutti, as the Germans like to call her, uh, the maternal figure appears. Now, that exchange um, merits going through uh, just prima gamma. You did it really well, in very colloquial language again. All this language is colloquial. I'm not going to go through the details of the difficult people. I just, I'm interested here in the changing frames, okay? The moderator comes in and says, well, it's not about doing things well, is it? This is a very difficult, stressful, uh, worrying uh, situation. So, it's not you didn't do it well. We're talking about reality here, the reality of all these refugees in, in Europe, aren't we? And Merkel turns around and says, yes, I know that, you idiot. Doesn't say that. <laughs> yes, it's a difficult situation, but... And then she turns around, that's why I want to streichel, which is a key word I'm going to come to, here rendered as comfort, her third person, okay? Let's see. Because I singular, whoops, we, plural, this is what's missed in the subtitles, if you were following the subtitles, okay, do not want to put you, euch, second person plural, or you second person intimate second person plural refugees, okay, in such situations, because it's very difficult for du, you, singular, okay, because you presented it really well for a now, in these frames, we're going from the moderator's pretense that this is a representation of a wider reality to the immediate realization. Michael says, no, I'm not going to play in that space. I'm going to play in this space, which is you and me. But I don't really want to. It's not really me. It's, it's me, plural. Oh, no, it is me, singular. No, it's me, plural. To you, plural. No, but it's you, singular. And there is this switching this uncertainty of what the communicative frame is, before she settles on an I, you, discursive frame. I am going to say this to you. And what she's actually doing here, I think, if you look at it, is say, when she says, you did it really well, you did it really well, it's like, from one artist to another, by gee, you did what I'm supposed to do here. 
which is put into words the situation of the collectivity. And she's seeing in Reem somebody who is playing her own game, but doing it better well, uh, even better and very well, because Reem has one discursive recourse that Merkel doesn't, yet uh, she can cry on television. Now, I think that encounter got a response, actually moved Merkel. Language and reality are deeply embedded here. In the non-translation encounter, all those little modal particles that you have in German, the doc, not, etc., are playing a key role because it's how I talk to you is negotiated through those linguistic resources. Most of the sentences are incomplete. They're reformulated. There are false starts and checks, but they do play a role in indicating the psychological position of the participants. So you get those switches. And it passes from a representation of a wider social reality to the thing to, to the thing itself. The focus is now on the event, not the representation, the event, the discursive event, and language is part of that event. That's what non-translation. I've been looking for a translated counterpart. I wanted to take that and compare it with something, for example, in the European Parliament debating this issue through interpreters. For me, I'm sorry, the translation includes interpreters. And I haven't been able to, I have, can't find anybody crying. We might understand that. I can't find the debate. That's even more worrying. What we have instead are images of heads of state meeting together and we don't know what they're saying to each other or in what language or with what mediation or how it goes. But if we imagine that that were a mediated encounter with interpreters present, for example, what we know about translation is that the language would be less embedded. It would be rather strange, like me saying to you, you are in front of me and looking particularly lovely. Uh, those particles do disappear. They're usually replaced by intonation, but the interpreters don't have time for intonation, so all that aspect of the discourse uh, disappears. Uh, translation cleans up incomplete sentences, the false starts, the hesitations. It's much harder, not impossible, but much harder to affect those switches of frames because of the simple act of mediation and the scarcity of discursive resources. And almost by definition, but not always, a translation purports to represent an event and not be the event itself. The act of mediation somehow defuses the immediacy of the interaction. And translation is cult on the supposition that language is somehow separable from the event. Now, I'm sorry, you're here to learn about translation, or to hear about translation. I'll come to that. But of the few things we know about translation, some of them are, are, are well known. You know, the, the fact that, that what Levy uh, discussed as tendencies, or as since uh, known as universals, the fact that translated language is blander, has less lexical variation, uh, omits the extremes of discourse, tends to simplify. Uh, these things we've known for a long time. Uh, some have lamented them, some have accepted them as a, as a state of translation. But I, I would like us to accept that some things happen in face-to-face -face communication, one-on-one, -on -one, that are harder to make happen in mediated communication. And I want to think about the consequences of that difference. Now, I've been teaching for eight years in Monterey, in California, and I have a practicum class there, and once a year I do an experiment which I stole from Andrew Chesterman, and it's where I get the students to come to class with 250 words in their first language, in L1, 
on the most wonderful moment in this, like a primary school essay, isn't it? What I did on my holidays. Uh, the most wonderful moment in my life. What I'm looking for is some experience that's close to them, written in their mother tongue. And then a part that translates that into L2, and then that text is revised by author and partner, since a revision is something I focus on a lot. And then I ask, well, quantitatively, who made the most changes? Can you guess? Who would make the most changes to a translation? Another translator or the author? The author. Why? Ah, because the text belongs to me? Sometimes. Then I ask the author what's different. And, and not invariably, but the majority response is, well, the translation's right, but it's not my experience. It didn't happen like that. It doesn't feel the same. You know, this equivalent response theory we've had since Eugene Nida doesn't really come into play because language is part of the experience, or at least of the way it's recalled within L1. Translation is going to lose something. It gains something. Yes, it gains a lot. <laughs> but wait a minute. Let's think about that and what happens. I do that experiment to give people the experience of being translated, how it feels, in the sometimes vain hope that they will treat others the way they would like to be treated. The Kantian ethics of translation. Okay? Or do unto others as you would have them do unto you, since we're in a Catholic institution. <laughs> With my research group, I've recently been looking not so much at the way people translate. That's, that's a practicum activity, and it's interesting because of the topic of the conference. Uh, we've been looking at, at the way translations work in the world, at responses, how people receive translations, with the basic question, is it any different if it's a translation or a non-translation? Hence, you can see my interest in the Merkel encounter. Okay? Uh, most of the empirical studies are, are disheartening. They show that there is actually very little difference for a vast number of texts, uh, depending on the type of situation. Okay? And I've been thinking then from the other way. If I can't get it bottom up from studying the way people read translations, uh, let's go top down. Let's start thinking on the cultural level and say, well, what would we like translations to do in the world? What would ideal mediated communication look like? Okay? Hence, my interest in that Merkel encounter. Why am I interested in that? Because of a theory according to which the workings of what's called communicative capitalism, let's just call them media, what we have currently are situations where discursive space or media space is occupied by certain beliefs and opinions ideologies, which might be those of dissent and critique about refugees in Europe, for example, and there is no response from those who actually have power. What can envisage a time when people on the streets would elicit a response from power. That no longer happens, according to Jody Dean in this paper, but it's an interesting thing to consider. What instead happens is that power occupies other media space with other messages. And you have a segmented media culture with very little uh, dialogue between them. Uh, in the United States, you'll talk about that's their narrative, that's their narrative. Everybody you know on social media, for example, shares your view of the world. Uh, but there's a whole lot of people out there who share a completely different view, and there is no, as John Stewart would put it, national conversation, no dialogue, no response. Now, I've been looking around for situations of response. Where is their response? Well, <laughs> Merkel did respond. What happened was, of course, Merkel Streiter, which is Merkel Strokes, you stroke a cat, you pat a dog, comforts 
facts of comfort of women, not really good. I mean, this is another term that's very hard to translate. Uh, this, this became a trending topic uh, last year uh, in German, with all these images of Merkel pretending to help everybody in the whole world by just stroking them. Uh, everybody who needed help. Everybody who needed help. And so on. Okay. And it became a source of mass dissent and critique of her action, which I think was not a bad action, because she did respond. Uh, her office responded by insisting that the whole video be put on the web so everybody could see the whole thing instead of just the one fragment which elicits uh, uh, cheap criticism and parody. But also, uh, whoops, uh, she has since quite radically changed German policy on immigration. I won't say because of that, and I won't say because of the Merkel Michael hashtag, but it all helps. There has been a response there, and she's tried to move European leaders towards that response. And a Palestinian girl crying on television probably did, I suspect, have something that there was a kind of communication which has elicited a response. The theory that we are living in separate segments of separate ideologies with no possible dialogue between them, I think can be countered by that. The other examples, this is because of Michael, I guess, the Irish singer Bono, uh, made much out of a 2008 meeting with the President of France, from which he extracted a promise for, I don't know, 21 million euros to be spent for Africa, and said, well, that five-minute meeting got more than a rock concert. Or, oh, this is a life lesson I learned. I think we arrived late for a conference somewhere, perhaps Prague. Hotel clothes, no food, no drink. Just going to go to sleep. Michael came in late last night. He probably had to say that story. And I'm with Josie Lambert, who's an expert in this situation. He goes, don't worry. And he goes up and talks with the receptionist. And ten minutes later, he comes back with a beer and sandwich. And so Josie, how did you do that? Oh, easy. I said, and if it were for me, if it were for me, no, he said, if it would be for me. One-on-one -on -one communication can change the rules, break the rules, extract promises that were not otherwise forthcoming or produce a late-night meal and beer. One-on-one -on -one communication can do things that official, regulated, norm-governed communication cannot. Okay. I've been doing more of this. I've been looking for not just response, but the, the capacity to see through uh, closed ideologies. I've been interviewing people from Syria, they happen to be students at my university, and um, intellectuals in South Africa who grew up under apartheid. So these are people who grew up under totalitarian views of the world, that is in the sense it explained everything in the world, and as they went through their education they saw the cracks in that explanation. And my initial hope was that people who are multilingual, who have different cultural spaces, would be able to see those cracks uh, better than the others. Uh, so I was looking for languages, I was looking for literature, what did you read as you went through primary, secondary, university education. And the one common element in all the interviews I've conducted so far is, no, it's not the language, no, it's not the books, no, it's not literature, help, it's not translation. It's one person in my life. It could be a teacher, it could be an uncle, it could be somebody who traveled, it could be a priest. One person started to get me to see the world in a different way. That role of one-on-one -on -one contact is what has elicited response. And I, I get back to the question, well, can translation do that? Can translation act in that way? My question has been raised by others. Uh, Arno Leib, who did his doctorate in Finland with Andrew Chesterman, went back to Martin Buber. 
Martin Buber said there are two basic words. One is ich du, I thou. You, me, and the second person. Okay, which is the primary word. And ich es, I, it, is the other. And for Buber, authentic ethical communication is the I and you. For him, prayer. But that can be extended into the social environment. Some things happen when there are just two people talking. And the it other is a world of things, quantities, numbers, uh, which is secondary. The ethical act is with I and you. Arno uh, says that in translating, the ethical translation should ask not what does this mean, this piece of language, this text, this linguistic artifact, but what do you mean, author? What do you mean, person, mensch, in front of me? That's what I was trying to get at with my students in Monterey, with the one most wonderful moment in their life. Get them to reach a point where they can personify the text. See that text as a person who needs to be treated and interacted with as a person. And I still keep doing that. I still, still keep trying that. This is what Arnold May calls the ethics of dialogue in translation. And we try to get it into our training activities. In fact, we're trying to move translation towards that one-on-one -on -one communication. Except the one-on-one -on -one is translated with all. Okay, in, in, in that frame. Now, one of the problems is that doing lots of research with eye tracking and think about protocols, we find that this happens very rarely. The fast numbers of translators who have to go fast and work on material and text and are interested in quantities don't have time to do that. Translation as it's practiced professionally is not an ishtu, I, thou, uh, intimate dialogue. It's simply out of time for it. But we find other things. This is somebody site translating Amy Winehouse, at an interview. This is a man. The eye tracker here plots where he's looking. Okay, those dots are where he had a fixation. A fixation in the sense of, not fixation on Amy, but on, okay. Um, this is a woman. What's the difference? This is quite consistent, actually. Women personify more than men. Women look at the photos more than men. Women are, are better able to create or see a person behind the text. I, we don't know if this is producing a dialogue, but for sure there's no logical reason why you should look at the photo, but the, woman, the women tend to do so more than the men. There is personification. Something is happening there. Unfortunately, in the interviews that, cover, that uh, follow this activity, we try to get them to talk about whether or not they're translating the person or the text, and very few people ever use a name for the person. It just doesn't happen. I could do two things here, and I, I want to do both, I think. I think the form of translation that we have, the restricted form that we teach, the professional activity that we train people for, could be extended. We could start to allow people to recognize there are situations where you can add things, you can delete things, you can do more to switch frames, you can even use the first person, although that would technically, for European or Western views of translation, mean leaving the translation form. doing some publicity for a book of mine that's just come out. Uh, this is partly what I'm trying to do in, in this book, where I go back at the many typologies around of translation solutions uh, that have been done since by into the, the early 19th, uh, 20th century. Okay? And um, proposing that all these things should be available or two translators, and we should train people in all these things, including at the bottom, content change. That is, that you can update a text, you can omit things, you can add things, 
where uh, required and where legitimate. But I stop short at saying we should get rid of the Western translation form where the translator speaks in the first person about the author as the third person. That happens in 19th century Chinese translation, for example. Uh, Yan Fu did that, did translate in that discursive way. Uh, we don't do that in Europe, and we haven't done so for, for many centuries. So that's my first argument, train people in a wider uh, sense of translation, particularly their density change, that you can make things easier to understand, but you can also put in those modal particles uh, where you think it's going to elicit response. But look, I don't know here, but in Europe we are training far more translators and interpreters for the market than, than the market requires. I can quantify it. It's about times three. And, and the surveys that we have of where people go after their translation masters or interpreting masters is that at best a third, the surveys are in Spain and Germany, okay, a third go into the profession for some time, a third go into language teaching, and the other third go out and have adventurous lives. <laughs> we get together brilliant people who have languages, who are able to communicate, and we say, oh, you all want to be professional translators and interpreters. Reem wants to be a translator and interpreter. That's what worries me. The Palestinian girl. She could do it. She, she has a bunch of languages. She communicates very well. She should be chancellor. She should be a spokesperson. She should be able to get up there. That's what she's been doing in the German press and on and interviews on television. She gets up there and represents a situation, and more than that, creates situations, creates events. Now, there's a lot you can do when you have skills in languages and in multilingual communication beyond translation. And perhaps a lot of what we need in Europe, particularly in view of non-debates, about refugees, for example, the lack of national consideration and conversation is more of those. We need, I suspect, not people who can get in and mediate encounters to elicit response, but people who can get in and elicit response directly. And that might be you, Andrew. Thank you very much.